Handheld gaming is a medium of entertainment of which I am deeply passionate about. Why is this you may ask? Because it combines two of my favourite things, gaming and travel. Handheld devices have allowed me to continue to enjoy the pleasure of gaming while simultaneously travelling around the world. As I have moved around this planet over the last year, I have looked at so many different platforms. In just the last 12 months, I have left the UK and travelled around Greece, the United States, Canada, Thailand, Cambodia and Australia. And on this channel across these great lands, I have reviewed the Game Boy, the Game Gear, the Nomad, the Wonder Swan, the Virtual Boy, the Lynx, the Neo Geo Pocket Color and even the Super Vision. But many years before all of these devices came along, there was another handheld. Today we are going to be looking at the grandfather of all of these cartridge based portable handhelds. Meet the MB Microvision, the world's first gaming device of its kind. If you have become accustomed to my channel over the recent year, you will know very well that I love to talk about handhelds whilst playing them in strange locations. Playing the Virtual Boy in the Grand Canyon is a prime example of this odd notion I follow. However, I felt I needed to find somewhere more fitting for the Microvision. The Microvision saw release way back in 1979. So, for a spiffing young chap like myself, that may as well be Stone Age BC. So I decided that the only plausible setting to experience the Microvision would be in my man cave. Yeah sure, many of you people refer to your games rooms as your man caves, but that sounds like nonsense boulder dash to me. My man cave on the other hand is an actual cave, so therefore I am clearly more retro than any of you could ever imagine to be. Dwelling in caves, now that's real retro. The Microvision was released by the Milton Bradley Company in November 1979. Milton Bradley originally found success in the world by manufacturing board games. The rise of NB started all the way back in 1860 when the man Milton Bradley moved to Springfield, Massachusetts and set up the state's first colour lithography shop. For those not in the know, lithography is a printing method by the way. The main coloured images sold by Milton Bradley at the time were graphic designs of Abraham Lincoln, which sold very well until Lincoln grew his beard and rendered the likeness out of date. Struggling to find a new way to use his lithography machine, Bradley visited his friend George Tapley. Whilst in Tapley's company, Tapley challenged Bradley to an old English game, even older than that of which can be found on the ZX Spectrum. This game gave Bradley an idea. Bradley decided to make his own game, but this time a game of which was purely American. The result was a board game called the Checkered Game of Life, which had players move along a track from infancy to happy old age. The goal of this simple game was to avoid ruin and reach happy old age. So basically, American capitalism for bloody game. Squares were labelled with moral positions from honour and bravery to disgrace and ruin. Something interesting of note as well was that Bradley used a spinner for this game instead of a dice, due to the negative associations with gambling you get stateside, which is fairly absent over here in England. By the time 1861 came around, over 45,000 copies of the checkered game of life had been successfully sold, and Bradley became thoroughly convinced that ball games were his company's future. Amusingly though, in 1861 the American Civil War broke out, so good old Milton started manufacturing weapons briefly instead. However though, in a hilarious turnaround, Milton quickly turned his attention back to board games, after noticing how bored the bloody soldiers were who were stationed around his town. Bradley began producing small games that the soldiers could play during their downtime. These are regarded as the first travel games in the country. These games included chess, checkers, backgammon, dominoes and of course the checker game of life. Handheld games around the world. By the 1870s the company were producing dozens of games and capitalising on facts. Milton Bradley became the first manufacturer in America to make croquet sets. When 1880 came around, the company grew even further and started manufacturing lots of jigsaw puzzles too. By the turn of the century, the company were also producing a number of educational supplies that made up a large portion of their income. As we arrived in the 20th century, MB continued to produce games, particularly parlour games played by adults. 
These classics included Visit the Gypsies, Word Gardening, Happy Days in Old New England, and Fortune Telling. I don't know about you, but these all sound like fantastic retro games for me to review on this channel. I'm sure you would all love me to play Visit the Gypsies. The man, the myth, the legend, Milton Bradley, sadly died in 1911, and his former company passed through a number of hands and went through a period of decline, right into the 1930s depression. Few people were spending money on board games than ever before, and the company kept losing money until the 1940s, when they sunk too low and banks demanded payments on loan. Desperate to avoid bankruptcy, the board of directors made moves to decrease the company's debt. They began a major renovation of MB's manufacturing plant and began by burning old inventory that had been accumulating since the turn of the century. During World War II, Milton Bradley reproduced a revised version of their game kits for soldiers, which were previously sold during the Civil War. World War II was a major success for MB, earning the company $2 million in profits. The next big milestone in history was the advent of television. One would think that an entertainment medium like this could have completely destroyed the humble board game. However, MB managed to play this new technology to their advantage, and by 1959, Milton Bradley released Concentration, a memory game based on an NBC television show of the same name. The game was such a success that editions were issued annually right the way up into 1982, long after the actual show itself was cancelled in 1973. 100 years into this great company's history saw the debut of the game Twister. And as you will be aware, Twister became a phenomenon and is a household name in board gaming right up until this very day. So going into the 1970s, this savvy gaming company who constantly moved with the times began to focus its attention to yet another new cutting edge entertainment medium, electronic gaming. MB were not one of the earliest companies to enter into this market, However, when they did, in 1978, they released a little game known as Simon, which by the time 1980 came around, Simon was MB's best-selling item. However, Simon is not the focus of this video, we are looking at another electronic gaming device developed by MB, the world's first ever handheld cartridge-based games console, the Microvision. The Microvision was designed by Jay Smith, the engineer who would later go on to design the Vectrix games console a few years down the line. The Microvision's combination of portability and a cartridge based system led to moderate success, with Smith's engineering grossing $15 million in the first year of the system's release alone. Before we dive further into the Microvision side of things, I'd just like to touch on a couple more factoids regarding the system's history. According to Satoru Okada, the former head of research and development one department stated that the Microvision gave birth to Nintendo's Game & Watch after Nintendo designed a handheld around the Microvision's limitations. So therefore, if it wasn't for NB, Nintendo would never have copied the Microvision's gaming idea and gone on to produce the Game & Watch and Game Boy range. So there you have it. The blueprint for handheld gaming came from America rather than Japan, like many people would have you believe. The Japs just happened to steal the idea and refine it. MB pioneered handheld gaming, whilst Nintendo continues to perform well off the back of it. MB on the other hand though is no more. Back in 1984 Hasbro ended the 124 years of family ownership when they bought out Milton Bradley. NB, then wholly owned by Hasbro, continued to turn out games that capitalised on current trends. However, when Hasbro acquired Milton Bradley's former arch-rival, Parker Brothers, in 1998, Milton Bradley then merged with Parker Brothers to form Hasbro Games, finally killing off the NB brand for good. So overall, MB is a company who had a huge impact on the world of gaming, even over 100 years before any video games even existed. But as you know, we are focusing on one particular Milton Bradley product today, the MB Microvision, the world's first handheld gaming device with interchangeable cartridges, and the very platform that influenced Nintendo to create the Game Boy and Game & Watch ranges. Let's take a nice big close-up look at the Microvision, and check out why this little thing is so influential. Yeah! 
I was lucky enough to find a nice bundle on eBay that included a nice completing box microvision system along with a whole range of completing box games, all paired with instructions in case I run into any bloody difficulties with the thing. Surprisingly, you can find this system complete with libraries of games in great condition for extremely cheap on eBay. It is the perfect example of one of those systems that remains extremely cheap, due to the simple fact that the majority of the big retro gaming YouTubers have for some reason ignored the history of this platform. YouTubers such as the angry video game nerd, John Tron, the gaming historian etc. continue to push the prices up of many oddities from gaming's past but thankfully the microvision is still fairly untouched. The only huge channels who have talked about this one thus far are Ashens and Guru Larry briefly, but thankfully the system still remains fairly cheap, so maybe price inflation on products featured on YouTube mainly applies to Nintendo and Sega products, which is probably because those two companies have the weirdest maddest fanboys. So yes, the MB microvision comes in this very well made cardboard box, which has a lid that can be lifted off. This box is pretty much identical to a board game box, which I must say is rather odd for a video game console box. However, it is very cool, and it is exactly the sort of packaging you would expect from Milton Bradley, being a board game manufacturer and all. The system itself also comes in a nice leather bound case, which is exactly what you'd expect from 1979 really, with it being the period of rich mahogany and leather bound books and all. The microvision is very important, so it deserves adequate covering. Tongue in cheek comments aside though, the microvision along with all of these old LCD handhelds are very susceptible to screen rot, so the leather cover gives the system a much needed extra layer of protection. Screen rot can occur due to the liquid crystals spontaneously leaking and permanently darkening the screen. This can result in game units becoming unplayable. Extreme heat or simply leaving the microvision out in the sun can instantly destroy the screen. So it's always important to cover the screen over when it is not in use. In regards to the system's physical aesthetics, the quirkiest feature of all is probably the game cartridges. The cartridges for this thing are bloody huge and nearly as big as the microvision unit itself. Unlike with more modern handhelds where you slot the game in the back of the unit, with the microvision the cartridges slot completely on the front of the microvision. The cartridges act in essentially the same way that different faceplates worked with the Nokia 3210 phones during the 90s. So you could argue that the MB didn't just influence the Game Boy, but influenced one of the fastest selling mobiles of all time too. Apart from changing the colour of the unit every time you change to play a different game, another cool feature is that each cartridge offers a different set of buttons, so you essentially get an entire new button layout tailored to each game you choose to play on the system, which is innovative as hell if you ask me, especially in 1979. Obviously the microvision was also invented prior to the D-pad, so in order to move left and right in most of these games, you use this dial right here. Essentially, it is the same style of movement which we had with Pong consoles back in the day. 1979 was a very different time in gaming. So now we have gone over how the microvision came into existence and have had a little look at the technology itself, it is time to talk about the games for the thing. Like many pieces of hardware I've looked at on this channel, I have once again gone to the effort of playing every single game released on the platform. Lucky for me though, there were only ever 12 games released for this one, making it one of the smaller system libraries I have looked at. Something else I would like to add is that obviously with the age of these things, being 38 years old and all, is that with the units that do still work, the screen is starting to fade a bit. So gameplay capture with these things has been difficult in the past. Thankfully though, in the last couple of years, some intelligent chap has released a fully functional microvision emulator. So for the first time ever on YouTube, we can look at some of these games in bright, up close detail. Yeah! Microvision games are essentially as basic as gaming can get, without it, in my opinion, becoming completely non-functional. Let us start by looking at Connect 4, an electronic game based on the board game by MB. The game plays exactly how you would expect it to, and would want it to. It literally is Connect 4. I think the microvision actually shows a fair amount of artificial intelligence in this one, as your computer generated opponent can play the game competently. Next up, Vegas Slots. 
This game is completely pointless. Just a bloody fruit machine emulator. Like why did developers insist on making these and why was there even a market for them in the first place? Isn't the point of using a slot machine to try and win money rather than for the joy itself of playing the damn machine? The mind actually boggles, as I can also remember the microcomputer market being flooded with this sort of crap too. Why did these things frickin' exist? So now we are going to look at one of my favourites, Bowling. With this one, like Connect 4, what you see is what you get, and this game offers a very fateful bowling experience. When you consider how ridiculously limited the hardware is as well, my only issue with this one is that once you get the knack of it, it can become very easy. However, it is also very therapeutic at the same time, being able to get strike after strike whilst playing this one. Next, let's look at Star Trek Phaser Strike. I find this game particularly hilarious, as it is basically Space Invaders. However, you cannot move from your position on the screen, and only one enemy appears on the screen at the time. I personally find this game very amusing for how basic it is, but at least it's functional I suppose. The packing game for the Microvision was Blockbuster, which is essentially a breakout clone. The game plays well with the dial, however the game speed can make it very difficult at times to get a decent rally. Playing on a PC using a mouse instead of a dial makes the game even bloody harder. It is a fairly decent rip for a breakout though, so I can completely see why they would have picked this one as their flagship game. Come to think of it, the Supervision had a breakout clone as their packing game as well. What's that all about? I also thought I'd mention Pinball as well, since it is another breakout clone. However, this time the game has obstacles to bounce your square between instead. Personally, I do not think I would have been very amused if I essentially bought this game after I already owned Blockbuster. So yes, that was some of the Microvision's library. But something else which I have recently learned and have found rather amusing is that there are two homebrew games available for the Microvision as well. It feels like there are bloody homebrew communities for everything these days. The internet and the human spirit really are wonderful things. It's so impressive that people are motivated to continue to come up with such nonsense. Let's take a look at them. The first of these two homebrew games is a Microvision version of Space Invaders, a game based on the Micro's limited hardware, the developers have done a very good job of recreating Space Invaders on the rotting screen. The game handles well and if you fancy playing Space Invaders with just black squares for sprites, then this is the game for you! In the other homebrew game Bomber, you play in what one can only use their imagination to assume is a plane. In this game you fly above a city, dropping bombs below. One thinks the city is probably supposed to be Aleppo, with this being a recent title and all. You continue to drop bombs with your plane flying closer and closer to the ground. You win the stage if you clear the screen of buildings, you lose if you accidentally fly into one. Once again a fun game considering how limited this thing is. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen, the history of the Microvision. A look at the hardware and a quick look at some of the games in action. Is the system worth getting today? With this one I'm going to say probably not. From my perspective the technology and aesthetics for the system look very cool, but with the platform being the ripe old age of 38 years old, you may run into difficulties down the line maintaining the ancient tech. Are the games fun to play? Depends how you define fun. They are fun in the sense to marvel at, and in the sense that it is a handheld from 1979 yet they still manage to program games for it, but overall the games are very very basic. So I suppose the easiest and most pain free way to look at the library is simply by emulating the games. I was pleasantly surprised by the level of detail that has been put into preserving this system's library. So I say it is at least your duty to check out the Microvision games on a PC. So sit back, put on the Empire Strikes Back, and game like it is 1979. Yeah! Thank you for watching today's video, another Platform Bites for Dust, in my quest to review all the cartridge based handhelds. Tune in next week for more handhelds around the world. Shout outs to Shizuka Kabayashi, Mad 8 Productions, Andrew Bazanski, Peter Dawn, Mike Frost, Edward O'Reilly, and all of my other patrons. You make making content feel so much more worthwhile for me. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, 
and let me know any of your experiences you have had with the microvision yourself. Click one of the annotations to see one of my previous videos. Ta-ta and farewell.